Welcome to APUSH. To kick off Unit 3, we're going to start by with a brief discussion of the French and Indian War, which is just one front or one theater of what is a much larger war between the great powers starting in 1754. This larger war is known as the Seven Years War, and we're really not going to get into that. Let's uh, kick it off by taking a look at our objectives here. Take a moment, copy them down if necessary. And let's give a brief overview of the French and Indian War. So the French and Indian War started as a conflict between the British and the French over the Ohio River Valley. The Ohio River Valley, of course, is the area right in here on the other side of the Appalachian Mountains. The colonies, as you can see, are somewhat bounded by the Appalachian Mountains. And so because of this uh, geographical boundary, the colonies were starting to run on a broom and looking to expand into new areas. You may remember that there have been several previous conflicts between Native American groups backed by either the French or the English, or loosely aligned with the French and the English, in order to, in order to gain superiority over the best hunting grounds in the Ohio River Valley. But this conflict is going to be in some ways similar and in some ways different to those previous conflicts, because for the first time, we're starting to look at Europeans moving into the Ohio River Valley in large numbers. Specifically, in order to facilitate this movement, you get a group of colonists from Virginia founding something called the Ohio Company, whose goal was to subdivide and then sell land in the Ohio River Valley, land that may or may not have technically been owned by the British. And remember, of course, when we say owned by the British, they're totally ignoring all Native American claims, and this is going to cause problems in the future. So I'm going to use words like owned slash claimed by the British, but in reality, there are Native Americans there too, and they would be very surprised to learn that their land was owned by the British. So Ohio Company of Virginia starts selling off land in a disputed area, and now we've got conflict. The British forces in this conflict were backed by the Iroquois, whereas the French had been ba were backed by the Algonquin tribes. This is very similar to the, the organization during the Beaver War, which hopefully you remember about last unit. And so keep in mind, it's the French and Indian War because it's the French and their Native American allies versus the British and their Native American allies. And unfortunately, because this is how we always play the game, we're going to completely underemphasize the importance of the Native Americans, but know that they were fighting as well, and they are, they are important. The war was kicked off by a young man named George Washington, who was, this, who was the son of a, of a relatively wealthy Virginian. Here's George Washington. He was sent to survey the Ohio River Valley for the Ohio Company of Virginia, and perhaps to tell the French to get the heck out of this river valley because the British claim that they controlled it now. So Washington went to deliver this missive, and he ended up sparking a massive war. When Washington went, he uh, well, Washington went to tell the French to abandon or to get to get out of Fort Duquesne, which is uh, to, which is Pittsburgh, just very close to downtown Pittsburgh today. The French didn't necessarily appreciate this, and so Washington uh, then had raised a militia in order to try, attempt to drive the French out of Fort Duquesne. But because of a lack of uh, more or less training and preparation on his part, he was attacked by a group of French and Native Americans. He built a basically a wall that he called Fort Necessity, and his forces were very quickly defeated. He himself was captured, and his forces were driven out of the Ohio River Valley. So Washington utterly failed in his mission, but this did spark a larger conflict as the British and the French then would mobilize their regular armies to go and begin the battle. Here is a George Washington's surrender document where he signs a document that he can't read because it's written in French, where he admits to invading French territory and attacking a French fort, which the French then use as a diplomatic bludgeon to go and attack the British. The colonies, meanwhile, are still very disunified, with each colony having their own government without any real sense of coordination. And so leading citizen Benjamin Franklin proposes the Albany Plan of Union where he, uh, this is a political cartoon that Franklin created to try to convince people to join the Albany plan. Uh, I'm not going to spoil the message for you. Hopefully you can figure out what his, what his message to the colonists were. The Albany plan proposed a government that had a single body and uh, each colony would get one representative 
but no colonies were willing to give up any of their sovereignty. And so the Albany Plan of Union failed miserably. So with Washington defeated, the French and Indian War kicks off in earnest. Uh, we're not going to go into tons of detail about this. Uh, in Europe, this led to a massive realignment where Great Britain and Prussia became allies and France became allied with the hated Austria. The English strategy in this war was to bring in regular troops and overawe the French and their natives with their numbers and with their firepower and supplies. So William Pitt mobilized a significant force and shipped it across the ocean at unbelievable expense with the idea that the additional territory that they could potentially gain would offset the massive cost of shipping your regular army across the ocean. Because keeping regular soldiers in the field is unbelievably expensive, which is why for the most part up to this point, the colonies had relied on irregular militias that could just be raised from the local populace and then after the war, they go home. Whereas regular soldiers have to be paid all the time and, you know, and they're just a drain on society that if they're not fighting, they're not actually, they don't have a farm to go back to. So they're going to, the English are going to borrow massive amounts of money in order to fight this war. And that will come back around once the fighting is over. So there's two theaters that we're going to talk about. First, the war in the West. And by the West, we mean the Ohio River Valley. And secondarily, the war in the North, which we're going to push off to a little bit later. So the war in the West is the march westward from Philadelphia towards Fort Duquesne, which is again today Pittsburgh. The British raised a relatively large regular army under the command of General Braddock and along with an irregular force of Virginian militia, including of course, George Washington, they marched towards Fort Duquesne. But Braddock and his much more efficient or much more uh, well-trained and experienced regular troops learned exactly the same thing that Washington learned in that it's very, very different fighting you know, traditional European warfare on sort of flat plains than it is to fight in the forests of the Ohio River Valley, which are very dense and difficult to move around in. And so Braddock, the same as Washington, marched his troops right into a trap where they were destroyed by, again, a force of French irregulars and Native Americans, with Braddock himself being killed. Washington and the remainder of the army are able to march back eastward, and some of them are able to escape, but all of the supplies fall into the hands of the Native Americans, and the Native Americans and the French are going to control the Ohio River Valley for the rest of the conflict. So if the war in the West was an utter failure, how did the British come out on top? Well, the answer is things went very differently in the Northern theater of the war. The Northern theater of the war, the British had a massive advantage because of course, the British Navy was able to provide logistical support and also artillery support with ships of the line serving as like mobile artillery barrages or with ships of the lines serving as mobile artillery platforms. And the British troops were able to move into and choose their battles much more carefully because of the logistical advantages of you know, being along both the Atlantic Ocean and then the St. Lawrence River. So the plan in the north is to take French fortifications as they work their way in, trapping the French in the interior and preventing any sort of relief effort from getting there. So first they attack Louisburg and are able to take that fortress. The forces in the north were commanded by Admiral James Wolfe. The British forces in the north were commanded by Admiral James Wolfe, who is going to become one of the main heroes of this conflict. Wolfe is able to successfully launch an attack on the city of Quebec. And after being able to sort of sneak his troops ashore on a, um, an, elevated plat an elevated plateau above the city and set up artillery, he's able to force the Quebecois to surrender. It should be noted that James Wolfe was killed in this attack. So this is the martyrdom of James Wolfe here is a famous uh, British patriotic painting. I show you this painting for another reason in that just like my account of this war, it's going to 100% marginalize the Native American presence in this with the idea that most of the fighting was done by Native Americans and yet we really haven't mentioned them at all. So apologies, Native Americans. Our histories are written mostly about the white people who uh, were around you at the time. After the British took Quebec, it was relatively simple to cut off the, Saint, the, the city of Montreal and to move in and simply strangle and siege and starve the French out. So after Quebec, we uh, moved down and the British were able to surround the island city of Montreal, forcing the French to surrender. 
Once Montreal was occupied, the French had no way to get any support to the Ohio River, to the forces in the Ohio River Valley, and they ended up capitulating. The peace treaty ending the French and Indian War is known as the Peace of Paris, which established basically a status quo antebellum in Europe, but of course in the colonies, it's going to lead to a massive change of territory. It should also be noted that despite the fact that the French stopped fighting, the Native Americans in the Ohio River Valley never actually laid down their arms. And so in what is called Pontiac's War or Pontiac's Rebellion, a Native American chief of the Ottawa people named Pontiac, who we see pictured here, maybe. Honestly, half of the pictures of these Native American chiefs may only bear us a, a slight resemblance to them because our record keeping as far as Native Americans go is not great. So, but here's Pontiac, maybe. He is going to unite together the tribes of the Ohio River Valley and lead an offensive campaign, setting fire to all these forts that the British were now trying to occupy. And basically showing the British that although you may have defeated the French and you may have taken the cities in Canada, the Ohio River Valley is very much not pacified. The British attempted to spread smallpox to the Native Americans of the Ohio River Valley during this time by giving the famous smallpox blankets. But fortunately for the Native Americans and unfortunately for the British, the epidemic did not take hold and Pontiac and his troops were able to still hold and control most of the Ohio River Valley. So here are your objectives again. Take a moment and make sure you can provide a substantive answer to each of these questions. And when we come back tomorrow, we'll be laying out the broad effects of this conflict.